And, and I'm wondering, you know, Robert Sigwood had such an amazing career. What was it about Saturday Night Fever that sort of said, I want to build this entire film sort of around this event? That's a really good question. I mean, he, you know, it, it started with Travolta, really. I mean, he he saw Travolta, he'd seen Travolta early, I think, uh, auditioned for, it might have been the Broadway run of Greece or something. So he sort of was aware of Travolta and then kind of charted his success um, with Boy in the Bubble and then and then Welcome Back, Cotter. And he signed, he thought Travolta was going to be a star. So he signed him to a three picture deal for a million dollars. And he didn't have the pictures yet. He had Greece. He knew he could do Greece with Travolta. Um, and that's right around the time where he sent out his development guy, um, Kevin McCormick, to go look for a, a project, you know, some IP to turn into a movie that would work for Travolta. And that's when McCormick found the great Nick Cohn piece, the Tribal Rights of the New Saturday Night in New York Magazine. And there was something about the story that just turned Stigwood on. And he said, this would be perfect for John. And they brought it to Travolta and he said, I'm in. So it was really, it didn't start with the piece. It really started with, with Travolta, I think, and was just trying to build movies around him. Well, it, it seems like, um, you know, a lot of cases where there's some huge entertainment industry success, there's talent involved, but it's also a matter of doing something at just the right cultural zygos moment. You know, it's like Elvis in 55 or 60, wouldn't have had the same impact. And it's sort of the same yeah. way almost with Saturday Night Fever. This had been two years one way or the other. It just would not have had this kind of impact. Yeah, and what's funny is on paper, it shouldn't have had. I mean, by 1975, disco has really reached its pinnacle. This was a year before that article even came out, two years before the movie came out, because um, the, the song The Hustle came out and that brought disco out of the kind of underground clubs of New York and into the mainstream. So everybody was doing the disco. And by the time they were making the film, it seemed like disco was dying. There was already a kind of backlash to the dance music uh, of that period. So, so on paper, it didn't seem like it was going to make a lot of sense. But there was something about that alchemy and the vision that uh, Stigwood had, you know, the, the alchemy being the soundtrack and the movie, that making that connection. I mean, he was the first really to recognize the impact of what a movie soundtrack could have. And in fact, he releases it before the movie comes out. So he's kind of priming the pump in, the, in a way to get people excited. And by the time the movie comes out, they're just, you know, they're they're dancing in the aisles. So um, yeah, I mean, he, that was part of why, I, what makes him such an interesting character, I think he had a vision. There was a moment in the seventies from like 71 until maybe 1980 where he could not not make a hit, you know, it just seemed yeah. like he had the, the Midas touch. And, um, and, and to your point, I think really did capture the zeitgeist maybe better than anybody else in the seventies. You know, you, you touch a, a little bit about it in the film and it, watching it made me wonder if the fact that, you know, here's a guy, he's very successful. He's also gay in the 70s, which even if you're successful in the entertainment industry, not a great thing. You know, musicians typically aren't always the most open minded people in the world. And that maybe this story, even though it's not about a gay man, it's not, but he connected at some visceral level with this idea of you know an outsider and trying to to succeed when no one else thinks you can and everyone's against you that there's something about that that really appealed to him in some way maybe he couldn't define it yeah well, i think that's interesting let me unpack a little bit of that i mean I, it's true he was gay in the closet to the public but i think most people who knew him knew knew about you know that he was seeing men and that was part of the reason he understood discos because he would go to the discos the underground discos in paris um, probably in New York. I know he went to Rio. Um, and that's where he could be free, you know, and, and we say in the film, one of his closest aides says, you know, he was free to take enhancing drugs and kind of be who he was. Um, so he was aware of disco as a culture. So I think that's it. But you touch on something else that I think is a big part of, of Robert and, and less to do with his sexuality, more to do with the fact that, you know, he was an Aussie who had moved to the UK. And I think there was always a sense with him of wanting to be part of the UK royalty, the UK firmament. And, you know, and when you grow up in Great Britain, it's all about class. It doesn't matter how much money you make, you know, you're not going to, if you're born into it, that's what matters. And he wasn't. And I think that yearning is what drove him. I mean, he made such a colossal amount of money. And what does he do? He buys a yacht, the biggest yacht I've ever seen. It's so big, it looks uncomfortable. It doesn't seem like the kind of place you'd want to cruise around. But that's what was important to him. And I don't think he, I don't think he ever quite achieved that. And in, in many ways, it's it's the Tony Monero story 
um, writ large, but you know, that idea of yearning to get out and to sort of change your lot. And you hear that all the time in the movie itself where Carolyn Gorney is telling him, you're never gonna be anything. You're not gonna amount to anything. You're never gonna get out, you know, get out of the slums of the Italian slums of Brooklyn. So yeah, I think there's a lot going on there for sure. And probably why it was a success because he did have that connection to it. Now, just from a technical standpoint, what are some of the challenges about doing a, a film about a subject? Number one, there were events 50 years ago. A lot of the people, including the, the person you're doing the movie about are dead. Um, and, and I noticed that a lot of the, the movies is done in a way that really works well, which is audio clips and then, you know, underneath whatever footage. Now, was that a, a conscious creative decision or was it a, a fact of, oh, this is what we've got and we, we're going to make it work this way? Um, it was a creative decision from the beginning. You know, when I see these, there's something about seeing people in this moment. There were two things. I only wanted to interview people who were there. I didn't want to have historians, you know, opining about what it was like in the 70s. But people who lived both the disco experience, but also the experience of making and working with Stigwood and making Saturday Night Fever. So those were my requirements. And those people are spread around the world. And I just thought, you know what? And I, as you start to collect archival of them, you're like, they're just so great looking. They're such a period. And I wanted people to be immersed. The other, you know, great thing about working with HBO and with Ringer Films is they gave me the resources to get all that music. So it's like a little bit of a visual feast and a and it's a, the, the soundscape is really impressive. So I wanted people to be immersed in the moment and not have to pop out and see, oh, old John Travolta or somebody talking to camera that you know, it, it was almost like my idea was to encase the film in amber in that way, in a positive way, so that people could just really experience it as it was happening. And also it just happened to be a really great story. It's a great yarn. It's the kind of thing someone would sit down and tell you, you're not gonna believe the twist and turns in this story, you know, from the 21 year olds executive producing this thing, firing directors, finding music, you know, all the last minute stuff, all done on a shoestring and that it should make hundreds of millions of dollars in the end is, is makes it all more remarkable. It's, it's, it's a great story. So, so to me, I just want, I didn't want anything to get in the way except, you know, the people who lived it. Well, yeah, as you say, it's a great story and not everyone comes off as well as other people. Uh, certainly uh, Michael Eisner and Barry Diller don't come off well in this. They managed to lose Paramount a few hundred million dollars by basically blowing off the entire movie. That's true. Well, that was, I thought that that was an interesting finding, finding that audio of, that was later on when, when Michael Eisner was talking about how he had no idea what they had. He had no concept. A, that, that you know, Stigwood, in his mind, you know, he, was a mu he was making musicals at the time. And Saturday Night Fever is a, is a movie musical, even though it's very dark. It's, it, people, when people see this documentary and then revisit the film, they're going to remember, you know, most people just remember the opening scene and the, and the great dancings of Travolta. But at its core, it's a sort of dark, dark film. So I don't think Eisner saw it. He didn't see it until the soundtrack came out and he heard it everywhere. Everywhere he went, he was hearing the soundtrack. But by then it was too late. Stigwood had really done an end around and he had all the rights to the soundtrack, which the at the time the studios didn't take. And he had 50% of the gross. And he kept adding to that gross every time they wanted him to, as we say in the film, take take the F word out of the film. <laughs> he added more more uh, more cinemas to the, uh, to the list and how much money he would get. So he was a very shrewd businessman. And he did, he raked them over the coals. But at the same time, you know, we say in the film that helped Paramount through many sort of fiscal quarters with the success of the movie itself. I mean, it made so much money for them. Well, you didn't have a, a lot of time to deal with it in the movie, but I'm just wondering what your feeling is. You know, here's a guy, Robert Sigwood, he just cranks out a series of just, just culture changing movies. And then he follows it up with Moment by Moment and Sergeant Pepper and Times Square, which is one of the really cringy movies of all time. I, did you think that sort of stuff just passed him by or as you mentioned a little bit in the movie that he just got so successful he, he didn't care as much as he used to I mean it seems to be part of human nature doesn't it I mean the, the first thing is there in my experience in Hollywood and in many industries there are very few visionaries right the, you, mostly people are like they think something's a hit when 10 people tell them it's a hit but Stigwood was the opposite he was a true visionary he was in the mold of a Clive Davis or an Ahmed Erdogan or somebody who saw talent and knew how to exploit it, you know, and, and make the most of it. So, you know, can you do that forever? I don't know. Can you be a hit maker forever after you've made literally probably close to half a billion dollars off of two films, Saturday Night Fever in Greece? When you wrench two films like that out of the park, 
I think at some point you just maybe rest on your laurels and you just maybe take your eye off the ball. He spent a lot of time in the Bahamas. He spent a lot of time on his yacht and living his life. He enjoyed his money immensely. <laughs> and I think, yeah, you got to be successful like that. I think he really, as we say in the film, he had this great sense of smell, but you know, I, I don't think it lasted forever. And by the eighties, you know, he missed, he lost the, to, as we said earlier, you know, he, he became less aware of the zeitgeist. It's sort of, um, he seemed very outdated very quickly. Although I will say one of my favorite movies of all time, um, which should have been a hit with a young Mel Gibson was Gallipoli. I love that film, but oh, yeah. he, something he produced with Rupert Murdoch actually. Um, but it was a, it was not a box office success at all. But I, you know, so, so you know, everybody, there's a little gem in there, but that doesn't make up for uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lily Arts Club. Nothing will ever make up for that. That's a tough one to overcome. Well, the interesting thing about that and Times Square is the, both soundtrack albums are great. Right. I mean, you know, the movie's horrible, but you listen to the soundtrack and, well, maybe other than Peter Frampton, not his, his best moment, but, you know, <laughs> they're great. Set. So he, there was certainly still that thing of finding the music to drive the movie, but if the movie isn't there, then it just, it doesn't work. Yeah, no, absolutely. And he learned, he learned that the hard way. I mean, yeah, I mean, moment by moment is, is not a good movie and revisiting it. And when I was making the film, I mean, just the utter lack of chemistry between yeah. uh, Lily Tomlin and John Travolta is just, it is very, it was an odd, not to, I mean, it was, uh, it was a strange pick for sure. Yeah. I just think, you know, you, you just took his eye off the ball. He had so much money, so much money and so much success, you know, again, not just in Hollywood, but in, in, on Broadway. I mean, he was winning Tonys for Evita. I mean, there was everything he touched. The Bee Gees, you know, you got to remember, he's still managing the Bee Gees at this point. They're taking off Yvonne Elliman. I mean, he had so many, so many creative outlets that, you know, I think maybe just one of them dried up. And that certainly was true with his Hollywood career. Well, certainly we've been talking about Saturday Night Fever, and that's kind of the focus of the film. But the first, whatever, 15, 18 minutes are pre-Saturday Night Fever. And there's just a lot of great footage, a lot of great stories in there. My particular favorite is the little clip of Paul McCartney explaining how the Beatles decide they weren't going to get sold off to, to Robert Stigwood, essentially. Yeah, no, they did not want to have anything to do with Robert Stigwood. And you know what's interesting now in light of this? I don't know if you've watched the Get Back series. Oh, yeah, it's great. Um, you know, you realize how savvy McCartney was. I mean, he's clearly the guy with the business in mind. He's looking at the sheet music and thinking about the publishing and they just made Apple and, and they always refer to Mr. Epstein who has died. And I think for them, they did not want to suddenly, as Robert says in the film, be bought for half a million pounds. I mean, it's kind of remarkable if you think about it. And I think that really offended McCartney. And I think McCartney was offended by the Bee Gees. He thought they were a pop group um, and not on the level of the, Bee uh, of the Beatles. And so I think it was all just one big offense to them and it was the wrong timing. And Robert picked up on that and picked up and moved to New York and you know, the rest is history. Yeah, there's a lot of great uh, footage, uh, early Who stuff, uh, those discussions about him to, uh, managing them and stuff. And, and it's just, uh, you could do a whole movie about just that little portion of time. Oh my God, and there's more, you know, we had more in there. It's just after a while, it's like, because we had, I was really interested in the whole Nick Cohn part of the story and the way he sort of, you know, was all caught up in the new journalism and found this story and was such an interesting, there's a story to be made about Nick Cohn too. He's a fascinating character, like the, the father of, of rock criticism or rock journalism in, in, out of London. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that uh, there's a great story to be told about, uh, about the gay world in London of management, like Epstein and Stigwood, Kit Lambeau and others who, you know, were like, I think they call them the Pink Mafia or something. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Don Arden, I, one of the, I, I had talked a little bit to uh, Sharon Osbourne and Do her father was Don Arden, a legendary manager oh, of Faces and other big acts in London. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's an apocryphal, it's a great story about Don Arden going to see Stigwood because Stigwood supposedly wanted to uh, take a ban from him. I think it was Faces. And Arden gets him and dangles him out the window by his ankles and tells him to, to leave his band alone, you know? So Arden, and Arden used a lot of derogatory comments about, about homosexuals in London at the mm -hmm. time. He's a real, and, you know, Sharon talks about this. So there's a whole story to be told about that, that period of time, the 60s London, the music scene, and these guys like Epstein and Stigwood who were really running the show. Um, and with, you know, cause he was managing Cream as well and Clapton and the Bee Gees and the Who. I mean, he was at the pinnacle. Everywhere he went, he seemed to be at the center, um, which is pretty cool. 
well it, it is a really great documentary